Good evening. I'd like to administer the oath of office to the city appointees of the City County Committee for the Confederate Monuments and Memorials. I state your name. I do hereby solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina not inconsistent therewith and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of my office as a member of the City County Committee on Confederate Monuments and Memorials. So help me God. Congratulations. And now we will do the uh, swearing in for those appointed by the county. If you prefer to um, swear, you can put your hand on the Bible. If not, you can just raise your right hand. And repeat after me. Oh, sorry, raise your right hand. I state your name. Do solemnly swear that I will support, maintain, and defend the Constitution and laws Constitution and laws of the United States of the United States and the Constitution and laws and the Constitution and laws of the state of North Carolina in the state of North Carolina not inconsistent therewith not inconsistent therewith and that I will faithfully discharge and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of my office the duties of my office as a member of the as a member of the city county committee city county committee on confederate monuments and memorials Confederate monuments and memorials. So help me God. So help me God. All right, congratulations. I'll get your signatures afterward. If I could invite um, Wendy and Steve to make you make some welcome remarks. Good evening, everyone. I'm Wendy Jacobs, Chair of the Durham County Board of Commissioners, and I just want to welcome all of you and thank all of you for being willing to serve in this capacity. And I also want to especially thank our co-chairs, Robin Kirk and Charmaine McKissick-Melton, uh, for agreeing to serve in this role and really look forward to the important work that you all will be doing for our community. Thank you. I'm Steve Shul, Mayor of the City of Durham, and uh, I want to second what Wendy said. Uh, I am so appreciative of you all taking on this important responsibility for our community. And we have a terrific group. Um, I was so impressed when I read all the biographies, and we're very lucky to have you. And as Wendy said, I really want to thank our two co-chairs. Um, Charmaine and Robin have already been at it for a while, getting this a lot of preparation done uh, to help this be successful. And so thank you all so much. And please don't hesitate to call on Wendy or myself uh, if you need us. Uh, we, we are here to be supportive. So looking forward to your work. Thank you. Um, I just want to introduce my co-chair, Charmaine McKissick-Melton, who's going to give us a couple of opening remarks. So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for serving to the people on the committee. Thanks to the public and also thanks to Durham City and County. Uh, we want this public, we want this to be a public and inclusive and educational project for all. And we're putting a high priority on gathering as much information and input as possible from the community. As you can see from our committee members, we have assembled an excellent group that represent a cross-section of our community, uh, young, old, different races, genders, and from across the city and the county. 
We expect our discussions to be passionate and energetic, but also civil and constructive. At every meeting, we will have an invited speaker who is an expert on some aspect of our charge. And we'll also always have time for public comment and the committee's discussion. Some meetings will be in these chambers or perhaps the city council chambers. Other meetings will be in the community and we'll have facilitators to better capture the opinions of all of those involved. As a reminder, this is not a process meant to address the rights or wrongs of how the statute came down. Uh, our charge is very specific and forward-looking and is meant to lead to a final report with recommendations. So one, we are to engage the Durham community in an expansive and transparent public process regarding the public monuments and other remnants of Confederacy present in Durham. Two, to propose to the county commissioners a plan of disp disp dispensation of the Confederate monuments torn down outside the old courthouse as well as the base of that monument that remains. Three, to catalog all Confederate monuments and other remnants of the Confederacy or history of enslaved uh, existing in Durham. And four, propose to the City Council and the County Commissioners, as appropriate, a plan for the disposition of such monuments and remnants. And lastly, five, in addition, the committee may choose at its discretion to solicit recommendations from the public for people, events, and locations that are missing from Durham's historical narrative to be recognized for future public efforts. So we want to thank you again for all for serving on the committee, and we look forward to hearing from all the diverse voices in, the, in Durham. Thank you, Charmaine. I just want to say, if you are interested in, in making uh, a comment, uh, please, there's a form to fill in uh, in the lobby area, um, so please do that um, prior to um, our time for discussion, which will begin at 8 p.m. Um, I would like to now move to uh, our committee members and ask uh, people to give a one-minute introduction of who you are and, and maybe uh, what your interest is in this committee. Deandra, do you want to start? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Deandra Rose, and I'm an assistant professor of public policy and political science at Duke University. I'm a political historian, and so a lot of my work focuses on public policy and the way that policy shape citizenship in the United States. So I've been especially immersed in a new research project that has to do with African-American citizenship, especially since um, the post-Civil War era. And so uh, the, having the opportunity to participate in this discussion about uh, Confederate monuments is especially exciting for me, and I'm really excited to be a part of this. Hi, I didn't really think about what I was going to say. But good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Diane Ford. I'm a Durham-based uh, local filmmaker here. Um, and I decided to join the committee uh, because I'm interested in learning about the history um, as well as documenting uh, unknown facts or little known facts about the history and the, the impact that African Americans, black people have made on the city of Durham. Um, and I'm just very concerned, I'm highly concerned about the resurgence of what I would describe as overt racism and white supremacy, um, the violence and police shootings. And this is a, a forum for me to understand that, investigate it, and, and make an impact and change. Good evening. My name is Barbara Lau, and I'm the um, executive director of the Pauli Murray Center for History and Social Justice. I also work at the Pauli Murray Project at the Duke Human Rights Center. Uh, I was really interested in this because we're in the process of really creating a new community monument at our new National Historic Landmark, uh, which is the first landmark in the state of North Carolina that focuses on women's history. But Pauli Murray was such a fighter for justice her whole life who used many avenues, writing, public policy, um, legal avenues, faith community, to try to create a world in which everybody could really work to their potential and be the best person that they could be. So I'm really interested in this because I believe it's really important to connect history to contemporary issues and to have community dialogues that allow people to learn from one another. So uh, this seemed like an excellent forum in which to do that kind of work. 
Oh, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Charmaine McKissick-Melton. Uh, I'm a native of Durham. I'm a professor of mass, associate professor of mass communication at North Carolina Central University and one of the uh, youngest to desegregate Durham Public Schools way back in 1963. Um, I'm Robin Kirk, and with Charmaine, the co-chair of this committee, um, I teach human rights at Duke University, uh, and I'm very interested in this issue. I have uh, ancestry on both sides of the Civil War, um, and it's something that has been a part of my family lore uh, ever since I could remember. Um, so I think that this discussion about how we remember um, the Confederacy, how we remember what happened after the Confederacy is very much a part of my own family history. So I'm very interested in talking about this and especially engaging in a conversation with the people who are interested in this in Durham to kind of find a way to move forward in a way that is inclusive, that recognizes our history, but that's, that's also a positive um, way of dealing with our history uh, for the future. Hi, my name is Cynthia Greenlee. I am an independent historian. I'm a late 19th century African Americanist historian, so I do the history of African Americans in the South, particularly the legal history of African Americans. And so uh, there's an obvious interest. My, my kind of historical sweet spot is the 1880s to the 1920s, which is pretty much the heyday of the construction of monuments like those we'll be talking about in Durham. And um, I grew up in North Carolina. This is an important issue to me. I have family on all sides of this debate as well. And I've lived in Durham for 17 years, so I'm really interested in this being a accountable and truly inclusive community process. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Sappenfield. I'm the former president of Preservation Durham, which is the city's nonprofit for historic preservation advocacy. I've always um, believed that a city's buildings and spaces and monuments are physical manifestations of the community's values. So I'm interested in hearing from the community what our values are, and then let's figure out what we're going to do uh, to help make our city reflect that. Um, I also, I'm a North Carolina native. I grew up in Raleigh, and um, I've got three children I'm raising here in Durham, and we're invested in the future of Durham. Good evening, my name is Dominique Walker. I am a student, graduate student at North Carolina Central University. I graduate tomorrow morning with my Master in Public Administration. So I'm really excited. Um, I'm happy to be um, here serving on the board. Um, I, sorry, I'm nervous. I, um, last year, a group of students and I had the opportunity to um, survey community members um, within the Haytai community on this particular issue, and uh, we were able to um, survey over 50, 50 participants who were interested um, giving their opinions on, on this particular topic. And um, since then, I had got, uh, wanted an interest in serving on the board, and um, I'm just happy to be here representing my school, um, my community, and looking to engage um, my community in this public policy, public uh, public process. Hello, good evening. My name is Jacob Rogers. I'm the CEO of a uh, of a local pro economic growth coalition of businesses throughout the Triangle, uh, with an emphasis on land use policy. I'm originally from Birmingham, Alabama. I've been in Durham for uh, next month will be five years. So I'm. Uh, I never thought I'd be here in North Carolina five years, but I'm, I'm glad I am. It's kind of sucked me uh, and kept me here. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm here, you know, I'm here, I'm engaged in, uh, in this conversation, here to learn, uh, come at this with an open mind uh, that includes a balance of views, honestly. Um, and I think that's important when we're making um, policy, policy recommendations uh, to the policy decision makers. So uh, I'm happy to be here, and I'm, I'm looking forward to serving with you all. Hello, I'm glad to be here. My name is William O'Quinn. I'm a native of Durham. Um, attended all the Durham County Schools. Uh, my family has been in this area since the early 1700s, and uh, started out outside of Jamestown in 1680s, so we, we've been around a while. 
Um, and I, I really love this area. My family's always loved this area. Um, was a tobacco farmer, now I raise cattle. Um, and ever since I was, uh, and I put on one bio, ever since I was reading what they call chapter books these days, I had started studying American history and have studied all the experiences I can get my hands on on soldiers, civilians on both sides of the war. The, um, all the enslaved uh, documents of enslaved persons I can find. Um, and just want to make sure we get everybody's history told. Everybody needs their history told and it ought to be celebrated. And remember, also a member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans of North Carolina and it held several offices in that organization. Glad to be here. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we can go ahead, um, Adam, with your presentation. Um, Adam Lovelady, is, uh, his work is focused on land use law and local planning. As an assistant professor of public law, uh, and he teaches, researches, and advises on topics of zoning, land subdivision, transportation, renewable energy, and historic preservation, and was named Albert and Gladys Hall Coates Distinguished Term Assistant Professor for 2015 to 2017. Um, one of the areas that Adam has been working on most recently is the North Carolina law governing objects of public remembrance. So we've asked him to come here to talk about that law. If you'd like to see a copy of the law, it's outside on the back side of the, um, our sort of information sheet. So please uh, feel free to take a look. Also, we have um, copies of Adam's presentation outside. Uh, and we're also, uh, if, we, if we can, maybe uh, if Adam is willing to share a copy, we'd be happy to share electronic copies with you. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Lovelady, for coming and letting us um, get a little bit of information from your expertise. Glad to be here. And thank you for the invitation. Um, as mentioned, the co-chairs, Kirk and McKissick Melton, asked me to give an overview of a relatively recent law. Um, that was adopted in 2015 concerning removal and relocation of what's phrased as objects of remembrance uh, in the statutes. It's helpful for me to give, before I go into the details, to give a little context of, of who I am and the work that I do um, and what I can provide this evening with regard to discussion around the, around the statute. Um, I am a professor at the UNC School of Government. Um, while the, the agenda identifies me as a doctor, I appreciate the, the um, uh, advancement of my degree. I'm merely a lawyer, not yet a doctor. Um, uh, but our work at the School of Government, while I do teach some graduate level courses, much of our work and almost all of my work is helping communities and community committees like yours um, understand the legal framework, understand what the policy options are. Hello, Train. Um, but our role is very much nonpartisan and non-advocacy. I'm going to give it a second. So I'll, this evening I'll talk through what the law says, what ambiguities are still in the law. Um, but my role is not to advocate, advocate for a particular position or to uh, represent the committee or Durham City or Dur Durham County. Um, there are questions in the law. There are ambiguities in the law. And at the end of the day, it will be for the Durham City Attorney's Office and the Durham County Attorney's Office to advise you all as well as the city and county as to what's the correct interpretation of some of those questions and what the best policy options are or legal risks are. It's also further complicated because the law itself, this 2015 law, uh, has some ambiguity and some, there's some questions, some open questions. Some things are clear, but some things are unclear. And given the particular circumstances in Durham, um, that makes it, the unique circumstances here make it even more challenging. When the law was crafted, they didn't imagine that they, were, they weren't talking about a statue that had been torn down or a, the base of a monument that was remaining. They were talking about a monument that's standing there. And so between the ambiguity of the law itself as well as the unique circumstances here, there's a lot of question marks around how this law applies to your particular situation. With that, let me get going with the actual news. So the, the statute we'll be talking about is General Statute 100-2.1. It's a short little thing. It's three little subsections. The first subsection um, has been on the books for a long time. That is a provision uh, that 
for state-owned monuments and memorials, the State Historical Commission has to sign off on changing or moving those objects. Um, but that's specific to state-owned objects, and so it dep depends on uh, the ownership of the object. If it's state-owned, then it has to go to the Historical Commission for approval. If it's locally owned or privately owned, then the State Commission does not have to sign off. The other provisions, though, B and C of this new law, those are the new provisions of the law, and those are the ones that do apply to a local government such as Durham, uh, city or county, trying to think about how to handle its objects of remembrance. I can do questions as we go, or I can do questions at the end, but y'all let me know. Um, I, I, if there's a clarification, I'll probably go through all of them. Um, so let me, how about let's go through the slides, and that will probably answer some of the questions. No, It'll I mean, probably, it's really quick. I just want to know when were the um, section of the ANC added? Um, so 2015 was when they were added. Okay. The, the law was, the bill was introduced in April of, and passed the Senate, the State Senate unanimously in April of 2015. In June of 2015, the Charleston shooting occurred. And this bill was already introduced prior to that time. The language of this bill was already in the General Assembly and working its way through the, the committees prior to that time. The House of Representatives, the State House, then took up the bill in July after the Charleston shooting. So of course that was a topic of discussion in the floor debate, um, but in the end it was adopted by the House of Representatives. Um, it was obviously not a unanimous vote there, but I think noteworthy that the, the provisions were introduced prior to Charleston and passed the State Senate unanimously prior to Charleston. Oh, sorry, so they were, um, Section A was prior law that was on the books from the 1940s. Okay. And then in 2015 was when B and C were added. So it's unclear from looking at legislative history, it's unclear of a specific event that might have triggered that. Obviously there have been long discussions about various um, monuments, flags, names of buildings uh, in North Carolina and beyond, um, at, but I don't know of, of a particular event that was the impetus for this change. Thank you. Sure. So some of the... Uh, sorry, we're, we're going to save public comment and questions for later. So if you, Okay, yeah, just sorry. To, I turned it on after <laughs> I asked my question. Just people, make sure you're speaking into the, into the mic because we're also recording this. So, uh, yeah, so that will be captured. Thank you for that. Go ahead. All right, so in thinking about this law and how it applies, there are some important factors for whether or not it applies to a particular object. So one is what type of object are we talking about? Is it a monument or a memorial? Is it a work of art? Is it a flag? Is it a name of a building? The type of object that we're talking about, it apply, the law applies differently to different um, types of object. Ownership matters, so if it's owned by the state, it has to go to the State Historical Commission for approval. If it's locally owned or privately owned, it does not have to go to the State Historical Commission under the law as it's written now. And that's just the Historical Commission, right? The State Historical Commission. Just that, right. Yep. Um, the location matters, so um, the, the provisions apply to any object on public property. And so even if it is local, it, privately owned, if it's located on public property, um, it is still subject to these provisions. The type of action matters, so if uh, there are certain provisions with regard to relocation, certain provisions with regard to removal, and then different provisions with regard to alteration. And so what the local government or the state government is proposing, um, that action is treated differently depending on what the action is. And then there are some uh, exceptions that apply that I'll walk through as we, as we move forward. So what are we talking about? The, the term of art used in the statute is objects of remembrance. It's defined as a monument, memorial, plaque, statue, marker, or display of a permanent character that commemorates an event, a person, or military service that is part of North Carolina's history. Important to note here, this is broader than just Confederate monuments. Um, this is talking about uh, all variety of monuments, memorials that are recognizing North Carolina history and individuals and events of North Carolina history. 
And so it could apply to a uh, local high school that has uh, certain plaques and monuments to sports teams that won back in the day. Um, it could apply to a World War, World War II memorial. It could apply to uh, a statue of a prominent industrialist of North Carolina history. And so while the focus these days is obviously on Confederate monuments, the law is broader than that. But it also is specific to um, these displays of a permanent character. And so things such as paintings or flags, um, it doesn't necessarily apply to those. Um, so it kind of, it does depend on what the object is that we're talking about. The limitations that are established for these objects of remembrance, uh, any object of remembrance that's located on public property may not be permanently removed and it may only be re relocated under the circumstances that I'll walk through with the next slides. And so removal, if an object is on public property, outright removal is prohibited by the statutory provision, but there are provisions allowing for relocation if certain circumstances are met. For relocation, there's a couple of kind of qualifying criteria or factors that might trigger uh, relocation. One is when appropriate measures are required by the state or a political subdivision of the state, so that'd be a city or a county, to preserve the object. So if it's recognized that if there is a, uh, a statue that was in the floodplain that was going to be washed away, um, then relocation would be authorized. If there was, um, if, it, if a monument was being weathered and needed to be cared for, shipped off and be cared for to be put back up, then relocation is authorized there. Uh, one of the questions that comes up around this is, well, what if uh, there are threats against the object itself? What if there is uh, a threat of destroying uh, the object? Could that trigger the relocation? Potentially, but this is one of those question marks around the statute. It just doesn't address that and doesn't think it did not, um, it did not address that from the start. Another situation where relocation can be authorized is when necessary for construction, renovation, or reconfiguration of buildings, open spaces, parking or transportation projects. If there's a road widening project and um, there's a uh, object of remembrance there at, within the space of the road widening project, then clearly the city or county is authorized for relocating that object um, for that construction project. Could be transportation, could be a new park configuration, uh, could be a new parking lot, uh, but those types of projects could trigger a relocation. Now, there are limitations on when and how that relocation could take place. So it could be temporary or it could be a permanent relocation. If it's temporary, um, the object has to be returned to the location within 90 days of completing the project. So after that road pro widening project is done, not, within 90 days, the object needs to be returned to where it was. Alternatively, if it's going to be a permanent relocation, um, then the, the statute calls for the object uh, shall be relocated to a site of similar prominence, honor, visibility, availability, and access that are within the boundaries of the jurisdiction. Um, this opens some questions, obviously. There's some, some of those factors could be measured. Um, visibility or accessibility, availability, those are the types of things that we can we can go out and do a study of, well, what are the hours of operation of this site? What are the, what are the sight lines and visibility of this site? And we could find a similar uh, location. But then the other factors, things like prominence and honor, are subjective standards um, that, that would be uh, the subject of debate, certainly. Um, but they are criteria that are put forward within the statute for a relocation site. This, the statute is specific that um, an object cannot be relocated to a museum or a cemetery or mausoleum unless, unless that's where the object started. Um, so taking a monument from the courthouse steps and taking it to a cemetery would not be allowed under this, uh, under this statute. Only if it had started in a cemetery could it go to a cemetery. There are specific exceptions that apply and kind of carve outs from these provisions. The simple one concerns uh, historic highway markers that DOT puts up along the highways. Those, are, those can be moved and relocated without um, going through this process. Then separately, uh, privately owned objects of remembrance 
that are on public property but are subject to an agreement or um, kind of uh, provisions about the removal and relocation of that object, those are not subject to these provisions. So in some cases it may be that the Daughters of Confederacy or the Sons of Confederacy funded and put up a monument back in the early 20th century and they may well still own the object and it may be subject, that object may be subject to a, an agreement that in that scenario um, the provisions of the statute wouldn't apply, the exception would apply. And then finally there's the third uh, exception that an object that a building inspector or similar official has determined poses a threat to public safety because of an unsafe or dangerous condition. The, in that scenario, the, the exception also applies, and there are not the limitations on removal and relocation. I believe that the, the intent of this was something similar to an unsafe building situation where the building inspector or city or county official said this building's about to fall over um, and we need to do something quickly to resolve that public safety concern. Similarly, if a arch was about to fall over or a monument was about to fall over, uh, a decision by a local official that there's a public safety concern of the object itself um, seems to be the intent of this provision. But given the situations that have happened both in Charlottesville as well as here in Durham, it raises more questions of well, what about the safety around the object? What if it's not the object creating the safety concern, but uh, protest or um, counter protest in the vicinity of the object? It's another one that's just un uh, so another question mark that we have. Um, it's unclear. It seems the original intent was likely with regard to an unsafe object itself. Uh, I doubt that the drafters were thinking about the situations that played out in Charlottesville and Durham. Dr. Lovelady, uh, sorry to interrupt you again, but the page before that, if you, can you go back to that other page? Sure. It says, may only relate an object to a museum, cemetery, mausoleum, so on. It does not say may not. Did you say that before that? Because it cannot be relocated to a museum, right? Uh, yeah, so the way it's phrased, um, the government may only relocate an object to a museum, cemetery, mausoleum right, if the object was originally right. placed in that location. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so if it was originally in a museum, yeah. it could be relocated to another okay. museum. Thank you. Sure. I have a question about the next slide. So the exceptions. So are there then other laws that govern the removal or change or move of any of, of those? I mean, I can understand the building inspector, but is there anything in there about the highway historic markers like what the conditions might be if one wanted to remove or move one of those? It's a great question. I presume that there are NCDOT regulations concerning when and how those are erected and taken down, uh, but I don't know the specifics on those regulations. Thank you. I mentioned this before, but uh, we'll reiterate. The, uh, the, the first provision, provision A of this law, um, it states that except as otherwise provided in subsection B of this section, a monument, memorial, or work of art owned by the state may, own, may not be removed, relocated, or altered in any way without the approval of the North Carolina Historical Commission. Um, so objects of remembrance on state property, Silent Sam at UNC, the um, Confederate memorials and monuments at, on the Capitol grounds owned by the state, those have to go to the State Historical Commission for approval. Objects that are owned either by the local government or by a, a private entity do not have to go to the State Historical Commission for approval. But they still fall under the law, right? They still fall under the provisions on relocation and removal, but not with regard to seeking approval from the state historical. Exactly. Question. Thank you. One of the questions that oftentimes comes up around these discussions is with regard to alterations. Can a monument that's, that stays there on site, can it be altered in some way? The state provision, which I just had on the last slide, specifically talks about alterations. It says that uh, a state-owned object may not be removed, relocated, or altered in any way without state approval. The local provisions don't speak to alteration. The limits for locally owned objects apply to removal and relocation. There's no mention of alteration. So arguably, there's room within the statute as it's written now that a local government could alter an object there on site to add explanatory plaques um, or to um, add additional elements nearby to, uh, to make some alteration there. 
but it's also true that an alteration could go so far that it's essentially removing the object. If the metal monument was melted down and left there in a puddle, if the, if the base of the monument was sandblasted so that nothing remained of the original commemoration, arguably that would amount to a, remo a constructive removal of the object, even if the physical elements are still there in place. Now, I mentioned at the start that this is broader than just Confederate monuments, and I know that uh, from reading the uh, scope and charge of your committee, you really are focused on the Confederate monuments, but worth noting for you and for the community that this law is broader, and so if there are uh, other um, monuments, memorials, plaques, statues, markers, or displays of a permanent character that are commemorating uh, something from North Carolina history, those are subject to these same provisions. Um, and so at the local park, if there's a plaque for who dedicated the land, at the um, local high school, um, or other public, uh, on other public properties, if there's monuments and memorials, those would be subject to these same provisions. A final note, and then I'll, um, I'll open it up for questions. Uh, is with regard to streets and street signs. This winds up being a uh, something of a peculiar and legalistic um, discussion, but it, worth noting. And I think the same the same holds true for buildings. The way that the the definition of objects of remembrance, the way that it's phrased and constructed, it is specific to objects that are put there for their commemorative purpose. Arguably, streets are not put there for a commemorative purpose. They're put there for traffic. And buildings are not put there for a commemorative purpose. They're put there to house uh, offices or buildings or dormitories or whatever else. But then those streets and those buildings are oftentimes named for a commemorative purpose. Based on the way the statute is written now, it seems that basic, uh, the, the naming of a street, the basic kind of conventional street signs, those could be changed. Um, because the street is a, is a functional street that happens to be named um, for a, some commemoration. But then also those streets, those buildings oftentimes have specific plaques or markers to commemorate that name street. Um, and under the statute, those kinds of plaques or markers would have to remain there, um, even if the name of the street was changed. But this is another area where it's really unclear the statute does not go into the specifics on, on how that should be handled or um, what the intent is with regard to um, streets or buildings. All right. With that, I suspect I've, um, I've bubbled enough questions that we can um, have a, a decent discussion. I will caveat up front that uh, for some of the questions, that there just aren't answers. <laughs> so we have until 8 o'clock for questions. So, yeah, Jacob, go ahead. Hi, thank, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, one question I would have, I, there's probably a two-part, but uh, I'll say the, ask the first one. Uh, what are the consequences of not complying with the statute? No, not complying with the statute. question was, what are the consequences for not complying with the statute? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, a, a couple of things to, to keep in mind. One is you each just took an oath to uphold the laws and constitution of the of uh, the U.S. and the state. These are laws of the state of North Carolina. Um, and so you'd be going against the oath that you just took. Um, uh, but then there are separate legal questions about who would have standing to challenge um, uh, a, a, if a city or county were to not f comply, who would have the standing to challenge that in court. Um, that would be an open, uh, an open question and would be depend on the facts and the sp excuse me, specific circumstance. It's also worth noting that the, um, looking at uh, examples from other southern states, there certainly can be political ramifications for cities that go against the state laws. Um, and there's certainly been action in Tennessee with regard to Memphis taking steps to um, kind of sidestep the state law there. Um, and then the, the state legislature um, having kind of uh, withdrawing some funds from the city and then also changing laws to follow up on that. Okay, the second part of that is the uh, is there liability for the county at the moment for not complying? So I, I would defer that question to the city or county. I haven't looked at the specifics of what the city and county have done. Um, so okay. that really would be a question for the for the city or county to address. It's, I just don't know enough of the facts or, or what's happening with it. 
If I could just uh, just do a quick follow up to Jacob's question and, and invite you to talk a little bit more about other states and, and the Memphis example. But before so we do that, could I yeah. so, so to clarify that when you say who the question of who would have chance, standing to challenge it in court means that someone would have to bring a private lawsuit against the city and county to say that this was an illegal action. Is that correct? So it, it could take several different forms, um, but oftentimes the way that those situations do play out is either a private citizen or organization files a lawsuit um, to enforce the state law. But the state's not currently manning an enforcement of, of these things. So the, the state could take action. I don't have any information about whether that they would or would not. Um, but if there was failure to comply with the laws, there could be either political or legal action um, from, from the state, sure. Another clarification. You said that when he asked about noncompliance, that breaks our. Um, when you asked about noncompliance, uh, you said that breaks our oath of office. So, do you mean in the um, in the scenario where we recommend removal? If we, as a committee, recommend the removal, then we wouldn't be compliant, or we would be breaking the oath that we took. Is that what you meant? It's, it's a great clarifying question. So, the, uh, um, my understanding of the charge to the committee is making recommendations for the city and county. Um, and so, at the end of the day, you're not the final decision makers, and those would, it would be for the city or county to make those, uh, and, and the elected officials to make those final decisions. Um, so, I'm not trying to um, raise your concern of your personal liability or of um, uh, to raise additional concern for you, um, but worth noting that this is a law that is on the books um, and that uh, at the end of the day, the city and county will have some obligations of complying with that. If I, we, we just go back to the Memphis example. If you could walk us through what happened there and what the ramifications, what the law, how the law compares to what we have in North Carolina and, and what happened when the city took the actions it did. If you could just walk us through that example. Yeah, so I should say up front, I don't know the Tennessee law. Um, several southern states have similar laws, but they're all slightly different, and I haven't studied how, um, how each of them uh, handles things. Um, and the extent to which I know the Memphis example is just from news reports, and so I don't have, haven't studied it extensively. Um, the basics of it is that the city of Memphis transferred um, the, the Confederate statues in, uh, in a couple of parks, I believe, to a nonprofit organization, and then that nonprofit organization took down those statues. Um, in response to that, my understanding is that the, the state legislature in Tennessee um, withdrew some funds that were, had been appropriated for the city of Memphis and has taken additional legislative action to prevent those types of situations from happening again. So do you know of any places in the statutes that cover any sort of act of God clauses, like, you know, if lightning hits a statue and it... Do you know what I'm saying? That there, it doesn't seem like there's very much in the law regarding things that are damaged, whether it's through intentional or unintentional means. And so I wonder if there's any examples that you know of from North Carolina where anything like that has happened. Right. So as I mentioned from the start, given the unique circumstance here for Durham, um, certainly this um, statue uh, statute statute does not address uh, the notion of one being torn down and, and being damaged. And so then we kind of fall back to the basic um, rules and regulations for local governments in North Carolina. Um, so if a, uh, if a flagpole was standing outside of, of the courthouse and a car ran into the flagpole and so now we had a crumpled piece of, of metal, um, that would be, it would be a question of well, what's the value of disposing of this crumpled piece of metal. We're going to get a new, a new flagpole and put it out there. And uh, we don't need to warehouse a damaged flagpole. Um, so it would be a question of, well, is there salvage value in this? If so, um, then there would be procedures for um, disposing of it and recouping some cost. If that cost goes above $30,000, then um, it would have to go out to public bid. And, but if, it's, if there is essentially no value in the object, then it can be just disposed of. But certainly there are um, rules and regulations with regard to disposal of real property, disposal of pr uh, personal property that the lo local government owns. And uh, it, it depends on what type of property, what's the value, um, 
to whom is it being disposed. And so uh, one of the things that perhaps the committee will need to address and also work with the city and county attorney's office on is, well, what, which regulations would apply to this scenario um, and what are the options for moving forward? Are there, um, would you interpret any other language in the statute that, uh, that would prevent, that would prevent uh, a scenario similar to Memphis selling the statutes to a private entity? These state so, statutes? Yeah, so the, um, the statute also does not foresee or think about that. Um, there is the exception for an, an object um, owned by a uh, private entity um, and subject to an agreement about its disposal. But that seems to be retrospective and thinking back to early 20th century um, agreement between the Daughters of the Confederacy and a local government. Um, there is uh, the provisions with regard to relocation or removal are specific to objects on public property. Um, but then a question would be, so if, if that property was transferred, now it's on private property, does that mean that the city or county is exempt from these provisions um, or the nonprofit is exempt from these provisions? Uh, it's, it's not clear, but there would be a question of, well, did that act of transferring that, did that essentially remove this object? Um, and if so, that would be prohibited by the statute. So there's a question mark around that. Um, and uh, um, one of the lessons from the Memphis uh, example is that even if, there, even if that is legally with, uh, achievable, there also could be ramifications for the city and county around that. Um, I, I just have a quick question about, and this is probably parsing the law in, in this ambiguity area, but um, Dur I think Durham is unique in this debate because the object that we're talking about is no longer as it was. It's, it's been, it has been altered. Um, is there any clarity or is there any um, opinion you can give us about whether or not that still qualifies as an object of remembrance when the one might argue that the essential part of it, the statue, it has been removed? Or is it essentially we should think about it as the same as if it, the statue was still on the top of the base? It's a great, it is a great question. Um, there's not a satisfactory answer. Um, the, there does not, the statute does not foresee this situation. Um, and in other scenarios, it, if there was a, um, a, a county owned park with a ball field that got flooded, um, there's not an obligation for the county to go back and build that ball field. Um, if there was a city owned office building and it was destroyed by fire, the city does not have an obligation to go back and, and put that fire back. My interpretation is there's, there likely is not an, an obligation for the county to uh, repair or replace the, um, the damaged monument as it is. There would be a separate question of, uh, you, and you kind of point to it, um, there's still a base there um, that still commemorates um, the Confederacy and Confederate soldiers. And uh, it would be a, uh, a, a question and a debate as to does that remain an object of remembrance. It's still a large object clearly intended to commemorate uh, North Carolina his, uh, history. And so I think it likely is. But it, again, it's uh, an ambiguity given the, the way the statute is phrased as well as the unique circumstances for Durham. Mm -hmm. So another question, do you know if there's ever been or if currently if a local entity wanted to put up a new statue or a new object of remembrance that they would have to get any permissions on the part of the state? I'm just, I'm curious about whether historically, I mean, we see these kinds of monuments in county, in front of county courthouses across the state and it's unclear to me whether they had to get any permission to put them up. I mean, so in some sense, if they didn't have to get permission to put them up, then, right, I mean, there's sort of that conversation about why then do they have to have permission to take them down. But I'm just asking in the sense that if part of what we think about is um, is adding to the uh, potential uh, set of objects of remembrance in our community, whether there are any laws governing how or in what way we might do that. 
there, the, a local government's general authority, as well as some specific authority, allows for erecting monuments as it sees fit on its property. Um, if, the, if the city or county was acting to uh, erect a monument on state property, uh, then that would have to be approved by the State Histor Historical Commission. Um, uh, but there's not a requirement for state approval for uh, erecting new monuments. That would be within the local government's purview. And you don't think there ever has been? Uh, I'm not aware that there has been. Um, uh, important to note that uh, in North Carolina, local governments have the authority that's given to them by the General Assembly. Um, and as compared to some other states where local governments have broader authority to kind of manage their own affairs, North Carolina is structured in a way, the, the governance is structured in a way that the General Assembly delegates power to local governments. Um, it's my read that under that, both the broad and some specific delegated authority, there's room for raising, expending public funds to erect new monuments. Um, I'm not aware that there's a specific limitation on that. Maybe following on that question, this um, idea of alteration, um, I, I wonder if that's ever been tested. Like, uh, for instance, if you put an, an identical base, you know, within five feet of that base, or if you put an arch over the base, or if you um, put something in front or behind of that base, at what point does it become alteration versus, um, as you say, that you know the county's decision, say, to put a new object there. What what's your understanding of this idea of alteration? Does it have to be like physically be an alteration of the actual physical thing, or or could alteration also mean something near or or above, say, a. a Object. Yeah, it, it, it has not been tested. We don't have any clarity from the courts with regard to how this statute sh should be interpreted. Um, and so it would be a, it, it would be a debatable point. Um, as I mentioned, at some point, an alteration would be so drastic as to amount to a removal of the object. Um, but the notion of, of adding an explanatory plaque nearby, of adding additional monuments nearby, um, it seems to me the way the, fra the statute is phrased, with no reference to alteration, but merely reference to relocation or removal, um, there does not appear to be a prohibition on that for locally owned objects. If it was state owned, it'd need to go to the State Historical Commission for approval on that alteration. Are there any others? Stephanie, do you have another oh, yeah, have question? Getting ready to... I think, go ahead. Okay, I was gonna ask, um, the provision, well, the interpretation of threat to public safety, you mentioned only physical harm. What about arguments about psychological or mental harm? Could that be something considered? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question, and, and we don't have any answers on it. It's, um, I, I imagine uh, that this was crafted in a way and intended in a way similar to other laws. Um, so if I own a historic house, and uh, typically if I wanted to do some sort of project to that historic house, I would have to go and get a certificate of appropriateness from the Preservation Commission. But if there's a public safety concern that the, that the building inspector has identified, I don't have to go get that certificate of appropriateness. I can just make the change now because there's a safety concern now. Um, the, the best we understand, that was the intent of this, this exception, was a public safety concern of this object. Um, but there certainly are arguments to be made with regard to um, public safety surrounding the, um, surrounding the object. I think the further we get away from actual physical danger, um, the less likely it is that this exception applies. Um, but it's, it is unclear. What about inciting violence? Uh, again, it's, uh, it is a, a question, um, mm -hmm. and uh, the intent seems to be with regard to physical danger from this object itself, um, but it, is, uh, it, it is, has been debated, certainly. Do you think to be in compliance with this public safety exception, you would need some sort of letter from this similar public official as part of the documentation on why? the city or county chose to take the, the removal or the alteration? Yeah, so one of the factors for that exception to be triggered is that some 
uh, that a building inspector or similar public official has made a determination that there is a public safety concern relating to this object. So I do think it, there would need to be some sort of formal dis determination from that building inspector or similar public official. Are there any other questions? I wonder, um, Adam, if it's possible, if we do have additional questions, can we contact you? Would that be sure. acceptable? Great. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate that you came over, and I, I know that everyone has been very interested in your point of view, but thank you so much for coming. Thanks. Um, yes, we can clap. <laughs> um, if anyone in the audience would like to speak, uh, now is the time. We need, if you want, if you can come up and just give me your, you will be speaker too. <laughs> um, but uh, we'd like to have you come up. Yeah, just come up. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, great. You'll be second, and you, sir, will be third. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and if you could, uh, we'd like you to come up to um, the microphone here to the right. Uh, we're recording this session for, um, for posterity, and we'll also be sharing it with uh, the public. So uh, if you could make sure to speak into the microphone. Um, George Roberson, would you like to come up? Thank you so much for coming. And we have um, three minutes per speaker. Well, I'm gonna be real. Short. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be real short. My name is George Roberson. I'm a citizen dumb. I'm 60 years old. I was born on Super Tuesday of '57. I'm the reason why the statue is gone, and the reason why the statue is gone is because of everything that God just said. House Bill 100, whatever it is, the statue. It doesn't supersede. The United States Constitution Code of the 13th Amendment, which says no Confederate flag, statue, badges of honor shall be on government, state, or municipal property. As such, would be deemed treason. And this order can't be superseded by any state statute. Now I suggest you have your attorneys research that because my people are not gonna serve anything less than destruction of Confederate property on government property. Who are your people? And uh, also I represent Defend Down the 15. Um, my organization also, uh, our legal counsel told us that uh, Terror by government. Government terror is a great issue. And any, let me, can I give you a, a scenario about the, the trial, if, if I may? Sure. Okay. There were 15 individuals arrested, 15, for destroying that, that statue. Out of 15, one was guilty because they played guilty. They were found guilty because they played guilty. And it's because they were afraid of the outcome. That was the first one they tried. She was young. I think her parents kind of pressured her. The other 14 played not guilty. Three was dismissed on the first day of trial because they couldn't point them out as being a part of it. The next three was tried on February 19th in the month of Black History Month. And the first one was dismissed because they couldn't identify him. The second one, these three went to trial now. The first one dismissed after the prosecution presented evidence. It was dismissed because they couldn't prove they was there. The second one, they had a witness, an eyewitness, a security manager for, for the county commissioners, an eyewitness that pointed to the to the, uh, to the audio and video and said, that's him, and pointed to the defendant and said, that's him sitting there. They even had, in the video, they had him actually taking part of removal of the statue. The defense didn't submit any evidence, called no witnesses, but made a closing argument. Unfortunately, the three minutes is up. If you yes, could just close. Just one more second, please. It won't take more than just this short period of time to understand what's going on, because I'm trying to save my commissioners from a whole lot of headache. 
Ms. Jacobs knows this, Commissioner Jacobs knows this. So please bear with me. I'm getting to the point, and this is very important. They submitted the Constitution, 13th Amendment, and with that, they submitted a case law which involved Orange County, former slave, former slave master, where the slave shot the former slave master and was sentenced to two years. 54 years later, it came back and vacated the sentence because it was unconstitutional, because of a Jim Crow law. Could keep control of your slaves. Now, the same thing is, is come to pass with the statue out here. It has the Confederate flag on the base. Confederate, glorifying the Confederacy. It's treasonous all the way. Now, Judge Battaglia went back in the back, deliberated, came back and said, not guilty. Now, all 14 are free. Why? Why? Just ask yourself, why? It's the law. It is the law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roberson. I, I really appreciate your comments. Thank you for speaking with us. If I could have um, Dan Ellison come to the mic. Thank you very much. Hello. It's a hard act to follow. Um, and I'm on a slightly different tack here. But one, I, I think you all have a really interesting job ahead of you. This evening's speaker was more about trying to, you know, how do we get around the law and, and, and figure out some inroads, you know, is there an exception that we can figure out on what to do? But I, I think the more important task is just moving forward and, you know, coming to a decision, what, you know, what do we want Durham to be and what do we want Durham to honor? And going to the fifth or sixth one of your charges, which is the thought of what new monuments should be put up somewhere. I just wanted to, I don't know that I'm going to come to all of your meetings, um, but I did want to make sure that you had on your list some monuments to commemorate the LGBT uh, work that's happened in Durham and where the location for the first gay pride march in North Carolina and lots of gay history here, both lesbian and gay. Um, and I'd like to see that on on the list of things to be commemorating. Um, I did want to point out, I think, that Adam maybe misspoke just in the, in the quickness of something of one of your questions. I think he said that if a work was going to be put onto state property that it would have need to go to the North Carolina Historical Commission. But I think that would only be if it was going to go on a on a building site that was historical. So I think, I, I think, I mean, is Adam still here? No. Um, and also as to alteration, whether changing the environment surrounding a monument, whether that's considered alteration or not, um, that's, that's that, I'm an attorney and I, and I work in some of this area. That, and I'm not giving legal opinion, I guess. I'm just giving my personal opinion. <laughs> but the, there's other statutes where those kinds of things have come into play. So the Visual Artists' Rights Act, um, which is part of the Copyright Act, has provisions that address that specifically, which aren't specifically going to be applied in this case, but oftentimes lawyers look to other statutes and how those are applied to figure things out. Um, that's all I've got to say. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Mr. Gibbs. I should have said this before, but if you could just introduce yourself and, uh, and tell us where you're from. Uh, my name is Charles Gibbs. Uh, I was born in Edgemont and been a lifelong Durham resident. And I'm at 75 years old, and I'm, I'm glad I'm still going. But anyway, that's, uh, I guess that's enough information for identifying. And I, I was going to take a different tact also. Uh, the first gentleman that spoke, uh, 
that's something I'll have to look into at some point. But basically, and I apologize for my handwriting. I had an eye injection yesterday, and I still can't see worth a darn. But at any rate, I support keeping the statue or what's left of it uh, because it is historic. It's all of our history. Uh, and it's uh, an iconic monument to how far we have come. Uh, not everybody was, well, there's no need to mince words, not everybody was a slave owner. Not everybody could afford it. And I am pretty sure, I can't be positive, but from my upbringing, my ancestors couldn't afford uh, this kind of labor because it was not cheap. Uh, but at any rate, uh, oh, there's, I wish I had kept my original train of thought, but it's what he said reminded me, and I think he, we were charged initially uh, to, not to say anything about the events that brought down the, the Confederate soldier stature, but it can't be discussed without that. And I'm speaking just for myself, and there should be others, but I'm not going to speak for anybody but myself. That uh, it was hard for me to determine what that uh, what that demonstration was about. There is the Civil War, and there's now. And the representatives of that were part of of this demonstration were from at least four, if not five, different political active polit political activist groups, uh, of which I disagree with each and every one of them. Anti-capitalist, anti-police. Uh, the only place that I agree with them is that damn the Nazis, damn the Klan. That's my own feeling about it, and I don't apologize. Uh, Unfortunately, we, Mr. Gibbs, your time is up. Okay. But your, the three minutes is up. But thank you so much for your comments. And I, I, I would like to, just in closing, I would like to thank you people serving on this board, and I'll be getting back in touch. Uh, this is something that we really need, and we need to, it needs to be on a smaller basis, uh, individuals getting to know each other. And that's where my, uh, my relationships have, have been over the years, and I wouldn't take anything for them. So thank you. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you so much for your comments. Um, we now have uh, time just for us to talk. Um, and um, I think uh, Charmaine and I have been talking about um, what happens next and what you all, this is, since this is our first time together as a group, what you all think you need um, to be able to better um, engage in this process. Um, We've set out the dates uh, and locations for further meetings, um, but we haven't uh, decided on speakers for every meeting, and we'd love to have your opinion on who should be here or be in the meetings out in the county. We have one location that is still up in the air, and we'd love your suggestions about where that should be. Um, and just in general, what is it that you think would help us uh, fulfill the charge that we've been given. Um, so I just wanted to open it up for discussion. William, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'd just like to find out one thing. Um, I've been trying to find it out since last summer, but is it, was any, there's got to be some insurance that goes with this. 
and people I know have been trying to contact the district attorney, the county manager. We've not had any return calls, not any return email, and this is from lawyers sending, you know, request, and we'd just like to know the insurance and that the amount of it that was on that statute. No, I think that's a great, a great point, and we can certainly um, start to assemble a list of questions for the county attorney or for the county commission. Um, so if there are specific questions that you have, I think we can begin to... Uh, well, that's one of them. <laughs> yeah, that's one. I'm sure there will be more, but um, we can begin to assemble that list. And I, for one, I would like to know, like, who actually bought the statue. I'd like to have a little bit more clarity well, on Well, there's, uh, as far as buying it, I, I did, um, I mean, just from the sponsors that were uh, gathering money for the monument, it was um, the um, RF Web United Confederate Veterans Camp, the Julian S. Carr chapter of the United Dollars of the Confederacy, and the citizens of Durham County. So there was actually three entities listed. So is that a, a historical document you have? This is the, um, I got it from the uh, it's Commemorative Landscapes of North Carolina, it's online, but it lists what's on the monument when it was put up. The speaker that spoke, uh, General Wilcox, I believe, and also who gathered money for it at the time. So. so just to clarify that, I think that that public money was actually a tax. So it wasn't a voluntary set of, of um, contributions. It was actually a tax, a county tax. That yeah, I think the state gave, gave some to uh, need to check on that, but I believe they did. So let me just... Um, share an announcement. Um, I'm part of a group called the uh, Humanities Alliance of Durham. So it's a lot of different history museums and state historic sites, different folks like that. And we are planning an event on June 15th from 6 to 8 p.m. as part of Third Friday that's called Free History Lessons. And this is uh, working with graduate students and professors from nearby universities. It's um, kind of carrying on um, something that the graduate students at North Carolina State started, but we're engaging students from Central and from Duke. Um, and so there'll be uh, some materials available about some, um, some of what historians have said about the erection of uh, monuments in this period. And there'll be a handout that has some history about the specific monument here in Durham. In addition, we'll be inviting people to share ideas um, by making pictures and creating um, uh, and sharing their thoughts about what they think could be part of what's here or in alternate what could also be, um, be part of uh, monuments in Durham. So that's a public event right now. I think it's going to take place at the plaza downtown. Um, so that'll be open and we'll be inviting people to attend. And if anyone on the group wants to participate in any of the volunteering or planning, just let me know. Robin. Um, I, th I think one thing that is an important to me, and uh, I can imagine many of us already have these questions, um, are it's all legal questions. I think it's very important. I also sit on the Board of Adjustment here in Durham, and uh, and the good thing about that board is is I uh, is there's two attorneys to turn to at all times <laughs> uh, and, and get their advice. Um, I would I doubt that we could get two to come to this meeting every meeting, but it is I think having somebody who is um, familiar with state statute is uh, very important because I, I don't I don't I'm, I'm, I'm not going to speak on everyone's qualifications but uh, I went to law school but I'm not uh, I'm not very familiar with with uh, with North Carolina's laws in that sense so uh, I wouldn't be an expert and I don't want to use just my interpretation so just a thought. So you were saying it would be a value to have an attorney who can speak to some of the legal questions would, around this. I would state. love that, yeah. I do have one I would like to suggest for a speaker. An After, attorney? When, whenever you get ready to okay, make great. suggestions. I think another one of the speakers that we've, uh, we'd like to have on June 7th, which is our next meeting here, is um, Fitz Brundage, who is partly behind that Commemorative Landscapes website. Mm -hmm. And is an expert on on in general uh, 
sites of remembrance in North Carolina. So that's one speaker we thought about. What do you all think about Michelle Lanier? Yeah. I mean, that would be that would be a great um, addition, yeah. The other question I had. Um, yeah, if you could just explain who Michelle is. Oh, she, um, right now, well, I, she was, I think, just transitioned. She was the dire executive director of the African American Historical Commission, and they just, I don't know what the, yeah. the whole new title, she just took over as, it's related to. Director Monument. of Historic Sites. Yeah, director of Historic Sites. I guess She's the new director for Historic Sites in the state office. Oh. Yeah, cultural resources. Cultural resources. Yeah, yeah. and she's all, she's a documentarian. She know she she integrates a lot of documentary work, language spoken word. So she has a lot of um, oral history. So she could probably share a lot of information. The other thing was, is there a way to work? How can we find out the annual cost of maintenance? Um, you know, people who are paid, like what goes into maintaining? I guess the easiest would be the state statutes. The statutes. In the county on state ground. Um, Sorry, the annual cost of maintenance of, say, the maintenance base, and upkeep of the base of the statue, or so, whatever or more broadly, all cost that goes into the statue continuing to exist. Okay. I mean, yeah, the county has to clean it every time it's painted or something. They do a lot. They've been doing a lot of work over the last couple of years on it. So. Um, I know that a lot has gone into planning this, and I'm just wondering what type of documents you have access to that speak to the issues in other localities. So obviously we heard about Memphis. You know, we know that Richmond has a similar issue, but on a larger scale. And so I'm wondering if we can set up some mechanism to share information about how other cities and counties and municipalities are dealing with this issue. I do know that the Memphis thing was done overnight. I mean, it was really hush hush. They did. How yeah, much information will come out of that? <laughs> we do have um, a yeah, a reading list that also includes um, reports from various cities, Baltimore, New Orleans, and I'm going to forget the other one. But um, we, we have a, and if people are interested, uh, if you use the bibliographic manager Zotero, I can send the links to you where we have started to create a database of various um, uh, official reports, NGO reports, news articles, um, and stuff like that. So if people are interested in uh, being part of that database, I'm, we're more than happy to share that information with you and, and how to get, it's a free uh, bibliographic um, app that you can use that, that then gives you access. So I will, I will share that with you all um, as, a, as a way. And, and also, you know, be, feel free to add things to it that you think are relevant. So I think it's really going to be important for us as a group to decide how broadly we want to extend our vision, right? So there really are very few actual Confederate monuments, of kind of like what, what's on the grounds here in the county. That doesn't mean there aren't important state highway historic markers to consider or street names or places that relate to that particular history or that particular time period. And so at some point, I think it would be helpful for us to have a conversation about whether and how much of that we want to look at as part of what we view as our purview. Um, I agree. I would be interested in taking um, maybe a field trip to see what remains of the statue. Um, just to see its condition. And if there are other places that are on our, under our purview, I would like to actually see these things so that we know what the settings and environs are. Um, also, I'd be interested in having a conversation with the city and county about what their appetite is for legislating this. Um, should we choose to recommend action that could be challenged under the state statute? Um, I could see this being something that goes a long way and is expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so what's their appetite for taking that on? Yeah, as you know, we've, Charmaine and I have done a little inquiry about how many of these sites under our purview there are. So far, we've only come up with two that are clear, and that's the, the monument in front of the county building and the Peace Memorial at Bennett Place. 
um, which is a different kind of memorial. Um, but uh, our charge includes the entire county of Durham. And I don't know, uh, outside of the city of Durham, I don't know these areas well enough to be able to say there aren't, say, street names or what, what uh, Adam Lovelady was talking about, other ways of commemorating. But if people um, have ideas for how to, you know, kind of to put out the call and, you know, contact folks out uh, in, in Rougemont or Bahama or other areas just to find out, like, are we just essentially talking about those two sites or are we also talking about other, uh, other ways of remembering this and then reflecting Barbara's question, do we also want to include state historical markers? Um, I did a quick survey of those, and I don't think um, that uh, there, are, there are more than one marker that might be con related to our charge, which is the Julian Carr mar marker. On West Chapel Hill Street. Right. I'm not sure if there are others, um, but, uh, I mean, and the state does have a, a register of this online, so we can look, and I did look, and it was just the Julian Carr um, Marker was the only one, and I would say it's it's sort of it's certainly worth discussing whether that's because of his service in the um, in the Confederate Army or because of his legacy as a philanthropist and a businessman. And so th I think that would certainly be something that the committee should discuss whether that would be of of something that we'd want to include in our survey or not. So Bennett Place is a state historic site, I believe. Correct. And uh, <coughs> so we. That's a whole new kettle of fish. It's too far. I mean, we could make recommendations, but we have little influence on what they Correct. choose to do. It, though the way our charge is stated, we're we're supposed to be looking at public sites. So whether so, uh, I think the a list that we got from the Durham History Museum included uh, uh, memorials in private cemeteries, which I think are clearly outside of our our charge. Um, say Maplewood Cemetery or even just Gear Street Cemetery as a site. Um, these are private locations as far well, as I Maplewood know. Maplewood is actually owned by the city of Durham, so it's actually a public cemetery. Is it really? Mm -hmm. It's, it's private. Just... It's private, uh, private. Lots are privately owned. Yeah, lots are privately owned, but right. the property itself the property is owned itself by the is, city. So that would be a, something to factor in. I'm going to have to... I, the, the, going back to the attorney part um, you bring up a very good point that um, if we're going to make recommendations on state-owned property I think that we that needs to be very carefully considered well, very I, care actually I got other, interesting I, to think about bringing the site manager from Bennett place to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about the history of that particular monument and how they create the, you know, what their interpretive plan and mission are. That might be an interesting speaker at some point. Can you expound on your sentiments? Why do you feel? I, I just, I think that, that I, I, what jurisdiction does the county have over state property? Okay. You know, and, and, and on a legal standpoint, and what ramifications would the county have if they tried to um, alter that? So in, in casually talking to people I know saying, oh, I'm on this committee and isn't this going to be interesting work, um, many people have mentioned, well, what if they took it, took what remains of the statue and moved it to Bennett Place? And I, I've heard that from a variety of different people. Um, so I think this conversation with representatives from Bennett Place would be interesting, one, to kind of hear how they manage Interpreta interpreting this history um, and then to see how they're interested in collaborating well. with the city and county. Um, it, it seems like that kind of move is fuzzy in here. Um, but I, I've also heard people mention um, the fact that the statue is altered is now part of the statue's history and is part of um, the evolution of the civil rights movement 
in our community. And so the alteration of the existing statue um, is something to consider as part of telling the story. Any other comments or do you have something else? Mm. Uh, personally, I'm really excited about the sort of, and if the committee chooses a segment of the call, which has to do with what do we, what would we like to see? And I do think that this is an opportunity and along with the sort of database of how other cities have been grappling with these issues, you know, one of the things I think that really got lost in the conversation about Charlottesville was that their intent there was not just to remove the statues, it was also to make some investments in the community and to think about that as reparative. And so, you know, I was really moved by your comment about the potential impact on not just physically, but spiritually and psychologically of, um, you know, some of the research that is coming out about the impact of memorials in that way and recommendations we might make that would be um, beyond just the idea of even adding more statues, but thinking about addressing the greater issues um, that are really underneath all of this um, in the community and thinking about how we, um, how we begin to embrace that or think about it in that way. I wonder what people's uh, view is of how, how do we come to a um, agreement about what we think the limits of our charge are. Um, do we want to have a working meeting just for that question? Or do we want to sit with it for a while and think about it and then have a decide, you know, later we have a, our next meeting is May 22nd, so, and that will be a very different style of meeting. But I, I just am curious to know what people, and I know everyone is busy and, and has lots of other things to do, so how would be the best way to come to a better understanding of, of the limits of what we want to do? Are we allowed to change our charge? Are we, do we have authority to change? No. Oh, okay. No. But there is some flexibility in the sense that, um, you still choose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, in the way okay. we interpret it. Interpret yeah. Okay. Well, I think that raises the issue of how we make decisions in general. Correct. I think I agree. I think that's a good idea to really hash it out, clearly define terms, um, come to a group consensus about certain definitions of things. I think uh, there's different definitions about what is racism, what is justice, um, and I think maybe we can come to a consensus and then move forward with how we apply those in our decision making. Well, I'm just scared we're going to get too big, and we have to keep it narrowed down somewhat. And like I said, Robin, I think we need to think about it a little bit more as far as having a working meeting to decide this. Hmm. Um, so I don't know. It's first for me. <laughs> yeah. Me too. <laughs> um, if, if I may, um, I, I agree. I think that um, thinking about it is a great option to do, but I also think that it's really important to come together to do a working session so that we can map out and brainstorm um, an action plan or moving forward because, um, you know, I would like to value everyone's opinions on um, or a point of view on what the committee should do moving forward. So I agree both partly of thinking on what to do, but also convening and coming back together to, to map out and brainstorm what we thought about. Okay. Is that something we can do out of the public eye when you say a working session? That's we cannot. what I was going to point out. Yeah. Go ahead, Charmaine. Yeah, just the fact that we, we, well, you know, this is a, a committee made of city council and the county commissioners. Everything is public record when we speak to each other. Right. In any capacity, um, it is public record. So you do need to keep that in mind when you're emailing and talking. Um, so I don't dislike the idea. It's just that mm -hmm. it sounded like we really were going to have a sort of an in-house session. Oh, no closed session. Basically. There you go. We cannot have a closed session. So we are, we're, we're able to have this discussion, but it will have to be in the light of everyone else listening to us. Transparency. Or at least, yeah, at least maybe, yeah, listening to us in theory. I mean, Correct. we could have, for instance, we could ask for the county or the city to lend us a room, a conference room, meet, 
Right. But we would have to make it clear that the public is also invited. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, so uh, just to, to understand our, our, that that is a requirement that we went over in detail with both the city and the county attorney, which I don't think is actually necessarily a bad thing, but it's just something that we all have to kind of take into account. And we've also decided that we think that public comment is important, so therefore every meeting we have there would be public comment also. What about conversations we have with other people in the public? That's uh, that's fine. Yeah, if you're and if you you know if you want to uh, if you want to you know if, if we talk on the phone or so, that's fine. That's not a matter of public record. But the but when we meet as a body, right. that's uh, that needs to be public. Um, so I think the storm kept away people tonight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was hoping for more people. Yeah. I think as we get going to hopefully, and I, I would encourage everyone also to tell your network, tell your other people who you know are interested, you know, to be coming to these meetings because we have to. We would it would be wonderful to get the word out and, and get people here. One other thing we have just talked about, um, we just kind of recently found out that this was not going to be streaming because that was our concept. Right. Um, so um, we're still kind of in discussion to see if we might move from these chambers to the city council chambers where that might be a little more feasible. Mm -hmm. so, so we'll see. But we thought that was all worked out until a couple of okay. days ago. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the uh, because we wanted to have the we wanted to have the ability for everyone, whether they have some physical disability or because of their work hours, whatever the case may be, that everyone could still be involved, whether they're sitting here physically with us or not. Okay. At first, I wasn't sure if you meant like Facebook, but you're talking about no. just broadcasting on yeah. the city channel. Yeah. Okay. Is there any audio or any other yes. recording? Okay. That's why, yeah, that's why it's important to speak into the microphone. We are recording this today, um, and uh, by tomorrow, we should have it online, um, so people can listen to the proceedings, including now. I mean, that the whole meeting will be recorded, and and if you know, failing uh, having it be live streamed, that will be for these formal meetings. Um, our our uh, our plan. The other meetings in the libraries, we will not be recording and not be live streaming just because there's not the technology available. Um, but, you know, we, Cynthia has been kind enough to take notes today, so we will want to have, like, somebody, you know, at least at some level capturing uh, our deliberations and, and the engagement of the community. So I, I want I saw you had your hand up before. Yeah, I, don't, I, th I think I want to kind of echo what William said. Uh, the um, uh, seems to you know I don't want uh, I want to make sure I'm going to make sure I'm framing this correctly. But uh, the uh, you know I, I came to you before the meeting. I said, well, repeat to me the charge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so the the charge I think has been given. I think you know, um, and as we meet, it's going to evolve. You know, this this whole discussion is going to evolve. I think it, we ought to to some degree let that happen. Uh, not try to micromanage that process so much to where we're defining every moment of it, uh, but but I think there's going to be a lot of evolving. I, I feel uh, like it's evolved in the hour and a half we've been here mm -hmm. to me, for me. So that's all. No, I think yeah. And, uh, maybe we should talk a little bit about the structure of the other meetings that would not be like this. Our vision was to have a facilitator mm -hmm. and to uh, similar to this that we always have our speaker, of course. Uh, to give us some knowledge base, but then we would break out into sort of small groups with facilitators in each group. And of course, it depends on how many people show up and how many facilitators we're able to assemble. We're working on that. Uh, looks pretty good so far. Uh, but just wanted to mention that and to see if there needed to be any discussion about that with the body right now, because our next meeting is forthcoming May 22nd at Stanford Warren. So that's the vision for the smaller meetings. Is it comment, concerns, questions? Well, I like what you all did the tonight with the, where there was really sort of a question, right? I mean, you ask him to address an angle of this or an aspect of this. And so it may be interesting as we think, as we're thinking about this and thinking about the charge, if there are these bigger questions, that maybe then some of the speakers could address some of the questions. And then that would be the kind of the springboard for the conversation. And, you know, we can just think about it and maybe email you ideas about the questions because, you know, just thinking about who you're thinking about, I, I just think we've raised a, just the questions tonight to him have raised some really interesting issues that, that make me want to know more about some of those things. So we might be able to just imagine some questions and then it might make more sense, may, may make it more obvious who maybe some of the speakers could be. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. 
I think if I could just propose that we, um, Charmaine and I kind of think about a working group meeting for June, um, maybe um, between the May 22nd meeting and the June 7th meeting, and, and see if we can't find some space for that, uh, either in the county or the city buildings, um, and just propose that as a possibility. So we'll have a little bit of time to think, as you said, Dominique, just kind of sit with this a little while, and then uh, also, I think it's taking Barbara's suggestion to kind of begin to think of what questions we bring to each other, like how do we want to work together, what, what does, uh, you know, I think obviously the end project end product has to be some sort of a report with recommendations, like how do we want to reflect when there's consensus, and maybe do we want to just add that room for, for lack of consensus, when there were divergent opinions, because ultimately, you know, we're not the ones that are going to make these decisions, the city and the county are going to make these decisions, but, and so we want to reflect, you know, both condensed information, but also, you know, if there is dissent or if there is our strong feelings that are opposed, we want to be able to reflect that as well. Um, what time uh, would the working sessions be it's around this time? Yeah, it's, I mean, I don't, it really, is this time like in the evenings acceptable more or less to people? And, and we also understand that some people are not going to be able to make some okay. meetings. You know, we're a large group. We have two members that weren't able to come tonight. So if there are work obligations or family obligations for people, we understand that sometimes it's not going to be possible to have everybody in the room. But uh, we want to get a majority, you know, as much as possible. I'm available for a weekend to weekends morning. Or... Mm -hmm. I know you, William. You've got lots of different things going on with. As long as I've had uh, plenty of time to get a week or so to get it okay. sorted out, I with can, a I bit can of make time. Advance warning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, um, so we're looking at a date before June seventh and after May twenty second. Are you here? Or oh, June? Good. Oh, yeah. She's not. Barbara's going to be on vacation. She's gone. Much until, needed vacation. Until the f Monday the 4th, right, Barbara? Yeah. And uh, I, I could do Monday the 4th. Um, so June 4th, how does that look for people? Monday night. I won't be evening. present. I can already tell you that. But uh, Is there a sp particular day of the week that works better for people? Friday. <laughs> Thursday or Friday. Okay. Yeah. Me. What? okay. You're not ready on a Let's Friday. That is. Got other plans on a Friday? No, <laughs> I, I wish I don't. <laughs> so Thursdays are good for you, Dominique. Thursdays or Fridays, yeah. Okay. I'm not interested in Friday evening. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say me not, either. Not me either. Never, <laughs> never. <laughs> That's my Netflix night. Okay. Yeah. Um, so about Thursday the 31st. That's, uh, let's see, Memorial Day weekend is the weekend before that, before right. Okay. Thursday the 31st, how does that work with folks in, in principle? In principle, I think it's 31st. May the 31st May. May the the Thursday evening. That's possible? Okay. Yeah. So well, I will check with the city uh, and county to see if we can't get one of these rooms. Is this more or less okay for people to come downtown? Is that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And, and by the way, um, time, are we talking six or seven? I say seven. Seven to nine, say? Seven works for me. Seven, all right. Okay. Yeah, I was looking for six, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, six. Yeah, six, I mean. Six sounded better than me. But I yeah. won't be here on the 31st. But you won't so be here. Won't, yeah, anybody else? Can. Okay, everybody else is going for seven. All right. <laughs> I'll go for it. I'll manage. <laughs> we have you outnumbered. Yep. No um, are there any other questions, concerns? Um, I'd love to be able to share with you all the case study myself yes. and the other graduate students from North Carolina Central were um, participated in last year. Um, we just participated. What we did was um, we interviewed or we, we created a survey. We had limited time to do it, to put it together. And we were looking forward to possibly the county extending our time um, to survey more people within the Haytai community. but. Um, we were able to enter, well, to facilitate the survey to every fifth person within the Phoenix Crossing area um, near Central, and um, people were very outspoken with um, what we presented to them, um, very interested, so I'd love to be able to share that with you. Will you share that with all of us? Yes. Send it to Robin and she'll pass it? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. Okay. And when you say 
say share it, do you mean share it with the group or do you mean share it like with the presentation so other people are privy to that? Is that public something you would share publicly? Yeah, we've, we've presented our findings and recommendations to the Board of County Commissioners oh, in December okay. as okay. well as to the Joint um, City County Board as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that would be, I think yeah, that would be very interesting. Your mic is off. Cynthia, your mic is off. You got to push the button. Okay. <laughs> Are there any other? One last quick yep. one. The email address. So uh, who's monitoring that or is it possible to have access to it? I uh, agree only certain people res you know, respond. Uh, I've been uh, just not hesitant to put more work on people. Okay. But I'm happy to share that address with you. We've gotten two responses so far. Okay. Um, I was thinking more so about you having to forward it, but if we all can, you know, access it and just, you know, read the emails that come in, right. maybe agree someone be a designated, you know, communications person. Yeah. Um, I mean, um, it's really kind of up to you. If you'd like to be able to log in, I can certainly okay. make that possible. Are we responding or just listening through the uh, I just have responded. Thank you so much for your comments, and, you know, that's it. Um, so, and the comments that we've received so far, I, I've forwarded, I think, that I got one right before I left for here, which was more funny than anything else. So, um, <laughs> for the um, sake of consistency, it may be best for one person or you, one of you chairs to, yeah. to respond to that. I'm totally fine with you forwarding those emails. Yeah. yeah. Or we could set an auto reply. Um, or that. Especially, I mean, I don't know how much the volume will be, but just, we could set an auto reply. That I just don't want to overwhelm. I mean, it hasn't been overwhelming yet, but I don't want to overwhelm you all with <laughs> information and emails and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Just sync it up with my Outlook. And yeah, I understand. That's yeah. Gonna, yeah. Um, um, I'll, I'll look into that. I have to remember what password I put on it. Um, but what I've been doing is compiling them into a Word document so that we will all have that at some point. You know, when we when we complete our work or when we're ready to talk about a report, we'll all have all those comments together. And I should have, but it doesn't really matter tonight. I also have a little comment box, so if people don't want to speak publicly but they're here and they want to stick, so I will have that at every meeting from here on, just as a way of. Um, we also have our Facebook page, and we have gotten a, a a couple of queries from the Facebook page, but more about like where's the meeting, what time can I come, that kind of thing. So, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. You are duly sworn and now finished with your first meeting. And don't forget, we are tentatively meeting again on uh, May the 31st at 7 p.m. when you figure out where. Right. Oh, I'm sure. We always make Oh, yeah, Barb. Uh-huh. Right, Barb. <laughs> Seven. Seven. I'm sorry, did I say six? <laughs> it was, it said, was, was just, yeah, there. I was wishful <laughs> thinking. <laughs> we have, um, as, as Charmaine said, we have the different format for the, for the smaller meetings in the libraries, more facilitated. And we have facilitated.